So welcome back drifters. Today we're back in the garage and what we're doing is, well, we're working on rebuilding this diff from the RX-7. If you guys remember in the last video, we kind of showed a little bit of what was wrong with the new diff that we got. Basically, it's a viscous. This is a clutch style diff and this is the one that we're going to work on rebuilding. So I'm going to try to go through some of the most basic ways we can do that. But what we got to do is first tear this thing apart so we can actually measure the discs to see how many we need to replace, if any, or we may even be able to just get away with a couple shims. So. First things first, let's start tearing this thing apart. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take this little pry bar and work these suckers out. Just that way we can pop these gears out, just like so. There it goes. Sometimes it takes a little yanking, but they always manage to come out eventually. So if you can see there, these two are both the same size, so I need to make note which side is which. So all I'm gonna do is take out these bolts that go all the way around so that we can remove the pumpkin. They're 12 millimeter. Here's we got a long one down here in this corner over here, and we got a long one up in this corner. So opposing corners, looks like. So looking at this, we got two of these long bolts here. We got one that goes to this bottom part here, and then the other one goes up right here. Should be obvious when we take it apart. Okay, so this thing may be on there a little bit. We may have to kind of break the seal a little bit just to get this rear pumpkin off, uh, but we'll see when we get to it. This might be a little bit of a pain in the butt, but we'll see. Don't see a lip on this thing anywhere. Usually there's a lip you can use to break these things. But it looks like I don't see one, so. <coughs> I think what I'm gonna do is just take my dead blow and we're gonna hit up in this area kind of hard and just see if we can break that seal. It shouldn't be on there too tight, so. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay, that worked. So it's not even. It's not even on there that tight, so now I just need to separate these two carefully. I really want to get this thing out of here without dropping it. There we go. All right, boom. Okay, so there's a little bit of fluid left in there, but not much. So, good. I'm going to move this out the way. Okay, so upon inspection, this thing's actually looking pretty good. It's got most of the teeth that I can tell. Nothing looks damaged. The only problem is there is a little bit of play. Now, there's supposed to be backlash in this thing, but this thing feels a little bit loose. So we'll look at addressing that when we take it out. Uh, but the main thing is going to be the clutch discs inside here. Cool thing about these clutch style ones is this is basically what a two-way is. So I'll show you that more once we get this out and how it looks. So what I want to do though ahead of time is I'm going to measure what my backlash and stuff is right now just so I have a ballpark when I'm going to put it all back together to see how close we can get and to see how bad it really was. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, so what I got here is a tool I'm using to check backlash. They're very cheap. This one's not going to be the most accurate, but what you have to do is you have to lock the pinions that way it can't move around. I just jerry-rigged a bolt. I'll show you what that looks like. So all I did here was just run a bolt through and then lock it in here and hold it so that way it can't move. It's pretty easy. So this thing's getting about seven thousandths. Uh, it's pretty close for using what we're using. That seems a little bit high, so it might be a little bit loose, but that could just be because this thing's old and the bearings could be worn out or any number of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to tear this thing apart and then take a look at the clutch packs and measure those. So these are one of the things that I want to mark on both sides so I know which one this thing actually locked in because this is what you use to adjust the backlash. We may not be using the same one but just in case if we do, I want to know exactly which notch this goes in. Now ideally I'd want to use some sort of like chalk or something that I know I could get in there that's going to stay on there. Right now the only thing I have is a little bit of soapstone. So this is the little marker you use when you're welding and stuff. So I'm just going to mark a line and just be careful not to let it erase. Uh, but otherwise, it's not a big deal. We're going to be setting backlash to make sure it's on there right anyway. But this could just make it easier for reassembly, especially if we're just going to end up slapping it back together. It just depends on what we find in here. There we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the big end caps and pop those suckers off. Yep, we're just going to yeet it off. So I need to make sure that I know which side goes for which, but we're going to put it down on the cardboard where we got everything else. Bottom bolt. Now I'm going to go set these down. Now, this is the part where it's going to get kind of tricky because I want to pop these off carefully, but I don't want this thing just falling out. 
But again, that's where the uh, rubber mallet's gonna come in handy. There it goes. Nice and easy. Little taps. Got it, nice and easy. There goes that. Oh, there goes that one. I gotta be careful on this one. Okay, we're fine. Just gonna be very careful here. Okay, we got that out. Now I need to keep these on the right sides and go set them with the other bearings. All right, so now that we got these things out, we need to be very careful with these bearings so we don't break them because I've done that before and I don't want to do that again. Uh, but now what we got to do is we got to work on getting this ring gear apart so we can actually separate this thing. So yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So we'll get it out one thing at a time. Oh, nice. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay, there we go. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So far, so good. Now we need to see if we can pull this thing apart, which might be the tricky part. So I'll show you something real quick. If you look here, you can see there's a mark there from the factory showing how well this thing's lined up. So whenever we go to put this back together, we know for a fact that that's where the mark that needs to get lined up. Otherwise, if you don't have the mark, you're gonna need to make a mark. So that's good to know. Uh, now we just need to see if we can actually get this thing apart. The main concern is here, it looks like there was supposed to be some set screws, but I don't see them in there. So this could be an interesting challenge. <laughs> I did it! Okay, there goes that. That solves that problem. Aha, there are the set screws. Cool. Oh wow, look at all that. That was just sitting under there, just a bunch of gunk and clutch material. So that's a great sign. Under so under here there's a couple of screws that we need to get to. They're very hard to see, uh, and I definitely don't want to strip any of them. So unfortunately, Mazda decided that using Phillips head screws was a brilliant way to hold these things together. And I'm sure it is, but Fingers crossed I'll be able to get these things out without actually stripping any of them because I got bad luck when it comes to stripping bolts, so wish me luck here. <sighs> screwdriver, screwdriver. All right, fingers crossed this thing will actually work and not be in here super, super tight, but it does not appear to be the case. Okay, so I think I came up with a solution to get this thing off and I'm gonna have to use what's called an impact driver. The way this thing works is it goes in there and when you smack the back end of this with a hammer, it slightly twists one way or the other depending on how you set it. So it helps with breaking like rusty bolts. I use it a lot on my old car builds back when I had my 75 C10. This thing was a lifesaver. So we'll see if we can do it on this. I'm gonna take it off of the bearing so we're not smacking on the bearing surface. And then we're just gonna try it out and see if it works. So wish me luck yet again. I came up with a solution to prevent breaking this. Just set it on top of the ring gear and that keeps it from actually sitting on the bearing. So that when we go to hit this, we're not actually gonna hit the bearing. All right, let's see what happens. This is a, uh... yep, not fun. All right, plan B. Oh, there we go. Okay, that worked. Whoo! Basically, I just jerry-rigged a screwdriver into a socket. Oh, fuck. I think it's under spring tension. Huh. Gotta be careful there, I guess. Okay, so now I'm just gonna take this thing apart and see what we got inside. The housing seems to be okay. I'm just gonna set that aside for right now. And this is the container that has all the discs and everything. Oh yeah, these things are definitely seeing some wear. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna take each of these out and then measure them and see how out of tolerance they are. Because some of them might be okay and some might be bad, but from looking at this, it's, it's not looking so hot. So first we'll start up at the top and what we've got are these three discs. They look kind of like this. They're conical in shape. So, and the way that they're facing is that the convex goes down. So it's almost like a bowl like this inside. So these ones go up top, and then you've got this little flat washer on top of there. Next, we got these little inner pieces. We got two of these, these are little discs right here. So what's interesting about this, you can see, these things got these little grooves on them, and those are gonna be important for when we're checking for the wear. That's part of what helps with the bite. There's two of them that look like this. 
Okay, so we only have one inner of one of these. This side here looks basically brand new, whereas this side, not so great. This is the thing that makes it a two-way, essentially. So I'm gonna take the gear portion, which inside there, there's just a couple of gears. So I'm gonna take this whole piece as just one, because we're trying to keep this in as good an order as we can. That way I know how to put it back together. And then this is the other side of the gears. These are the other clutch packs here. It's the same thing, it's just flipped. So here we've got the piece that looks like this. So it's got little, little grooves in it. This is one of the clutch discs. So then on top of those, we got the rings, just like on the other ones. These are more clutch discs. And then it's the three conical shaped washers. So those are on there last. Just below that is the little washer slash shim. So now we can officially say this thing is a part. Uh, it's not even on here anymore. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take each of those discs and I'm gonna go and take a micrometer and take a measurement. And then we'll see where it all lines up, see what needs to be replaced and go from there. Well, as it turns out, I'm a bit of a dum-dum and I can't find my calipers anywhere. I think I let my brother borrow them, so I may have to measure that on a different day, but we'll see. I'm gonna try to get it in this video. But I wanted to show you this real quick, the inside of this thing. It's kind of cool, actually, the way this thing works. You got a couple of gears. You got a main gear here. I'm gonna use very horrible terms. You got a spoolie spool gear here, and then you got the same thing on the opposite side. So the way this works is, when this thing sets in here, it's gonna have these little grooves. You'll see these little triangles that are cut out. See those little triangles there? These gears ride on those triangles, and normally, when it's open, it just spins, but when it grabs, it wants to roll out of it. You see that? So when that friction basically pushes up against this and causes it to want to roll out, that's what can cause it to open or close. So this is technically a two-way diff. So you can see there, when this thing wants to lock, what's gonna happen when they're on D-cell or X-cell, it'll open up. There's two different directions this thing can go. But those springs and the clutch discs are what push up against this to hold it all together. So it depends on when those things wear out and it's not applying the pressure like it's supposed to, it'll just open up and spin like a regular open diff. So the main idea here is that this diff is actually a really good diff. Ideally, if those shims are close enough, what we can do is just make a shim and create that extra tension on this so that way it actually closes. Because in drifting, I mean, I'd be happy with the welded diff, but trying to weld all this nonsense is just a lot of extra work. And why would I weld a perfectly good diff that could be rebuilt? So depending on how bad it is or how many parts I need to buy to rebuild it, I would prefer just to rebuild it at this point. I mean, we're already this deep, we may as well. And then we'll have a limited slip and not a welded diff where welded diffs are great and all, but I'd rather have the limited slip in case if I'm driving on the street and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do. All right, so I got my calipers, so now all I'm gonna do is go ahead and take these measurements, write them down, and then I'll explain exactly what we're doing after. All right, so for this next part, you may need to grab your pocket protectors, grab your spectacles, because it's about to get real technical. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this piece without any of the spider gears. We're just gonna place that in there with this on top, and then we're gonna take some of the pressure discs and put them up here. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, we're gonna place the friction disc, these two little plates here, and then we're gonna put one of these springs on top, and then we're gonna do the same exact thing on the bottom and take that measurement. And then we measure this entire unit. So that's what we do next. We write that measurement down, which for us is 87.68. So unfortunately, it looks as though my readings are way, way off. So all of my friction discs are way outside the limit. The limit is 1.9 millimeters. Most of mine average about 1.6 to 1.7. So my friction discs are completely shot. Now to figure out about the springs, the thing is there are no replacement springs. Those conical shaped things, the things that look like little bowls and they provide the spring tension. There's six on the turbo model. They don't have a replacement for it. And in the tech manual, the way that you do it is by doing this measurement that I showed you where you clamp everything together and you take that measurement. So the way that you measure the thickness for the springs are you add up all of their thicknesses to get your first value. So on the turbo, there's six of them. You add that up and that is what's called your A. I don't know why they label it a, as an A, but that's what it is. So to get the L1 measurement, what you're doing is you're taking the spider gears, but without them on it, it's just a little cross section. 
you clamp it all together and then you put two pressure plates, two of the friction plates, and four of the friction discs. Okay, the friction discs are the ones that have the tabs to the inside, the plates have it to the outside. So you put those together and then you take that measurement, that's your L1. And then what you do is you take your A minus your L1 and subtract that from 91 millimeters. And then that'll tell you basically where your clearance is. And there's a set number of clearance that it can be within. If it's outside of that, you don't replace the springs. What you do is you get a thicker friction disc. Now in my case, I'm gonna get a thicker friction disc anyway because I want my thing to lock up more. But you know, in this case, this is what we gotta do. Okay, so I forgot to record this, but all you do is you take the casing with the spider gear and the two washers, you measure that, and then you take that measurement and you subtract it from 94 millimeters, and then that tells you whether or not you need to get a thicker thrust washer. So now there is a way to fix these diffs just using what's called a beer can method or the brake clean method, which is literally just an aluminum shim that you put in there. Problem is, is mine is so far out of whack that I would literally have to put practically an entire beer can into it to make it work. And that's just not good. So what I'm gonna end up doing is actually getting new discs, spending the money and doing it right and doing a full rebuild the proper way. So it's not that bad. It's probably gonna cost me a couple hundred bucks but a couple hundred bucks, I know it'll lock, I know it'll ride right, I can ride it on the street, it'll be worth it. So now all I gotta do basically is order all these parts, get it ready to go, and then we'll end up doing a full rebuild on this thing. So it's gonna be a few days before I can get to that because God knows with shipping and Corona how long that's gonna take. Uh, but the good thing is in the background, I've been getting parts for the BMW, so I'm gonna be working on that next. I'm planning on doing the lower control arm swap. It's a E36 to E46 swap, so for any of you guys that are in BMWs, hopefully that'll be helpful to you. Might be interesting either way. I try to keep things a little bit interesting, but also so you learn something, so you're not just wasting time. You know, it's always nice to learn something new that maybe you didn't know before. And if you did know it, sometimes it's just fun to watch anyway. So I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. If you didn't, well, dislike it. Either way, it just lets me and YouTube know what you like and what you don't. But if you dislike it, you may not see more of my stuff. So. That is what it is. But anyway, guys, thanks again for watching. I'll be sure to see you all in the next one, and have a great day. Oh, and hey, don't forget to keep it nice and easy, okay? See you later. It just feels like you turn one way and the car wants to go another. When in doubt, grind it out.